Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this episode of the NEI podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Manpreet Singh. She is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Stanford University and the Director of the Stanford Pediatric Mood Disorders Program. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Dr. Singh, what is the prevalence of pediatric depression and does this change depending on the age or stage of development? It's an interesting question, Sabrina. The epidemiology of depression has changed as we've increased our understanding of the condition and how it originates, particularly in childhood. People used to think that kids couldn't get depressed. And with increased recognition and lower stigma, we've begun to appreciate that children can in fact experience low moods, lack of interest, and for sustained periods of time. So unfortunately, the prevalence of depression is increasing. In late childhood, it can be as high as 2% and increases in early adolescence to about 5%. And by late adolescence can go upwards to 20%. And importantly, the prevalence of depression among youth is also increasing globally. The World Health Organization had anticipated that the burden of depression would reach its peak in 2020, and we experienced that peak in 2017, three years premature to the anticipation, which means that we have our work cut out for us with these rising prevalence rates of depression around the world and particularly affecting young people. In youth, the most concerning statistic is that between the ages of 10 and 14, and if you're a girl, the suicide rates have increased dramatically. And it's the most accelerating of numbers in terms of prevalence. So we have some work to do to address this population and ensure that we have accurately and timely identify symptoms. Absolutely. What percentage of children are on an antidepressant and is there any risk associated with this treatment in this population? About 3.4% of all 12 to 19 year olds are on an antidepressant. And some people would argue that this number may be lowballing it, but Because it's becoming more and more recognized in youth, antidepressant therapy is an option, a viable option, particularly after psychotherapy options have not worked. It is indeed the right thing to do to first address symptoms and try to treat them with psychotherapeutic interventions like family-based therapy, interpersonal therapy, or cognitive behavioral therapy. The latter two are the ones that are most studied in kids. But when those options don't work, youth are often given the option of an antidepressant. And the challenge there is is that the placebo response rate to antidepressants for youth with depression is fairly high. Though placebo separates from a lot of leading antidepressant therapies that are out there, most kids also experience in these clinical trials a pretty significant and robust placebo response, which says something very positive about what we might be doing in terms of supporting youth psychotherapeutically, particularly if they're participating in a clinical trial. And we need to leverage that. But as is true for all psychotropic medications, there are potential risks for side effects. And the concerns for side effects become increasingly important the younger the age that they are introduced. So for these reasons, sometimes youth find themselves having an unpleasant response to antidepressants or an unsatisfactory response from the perspective of efficacy, but also poor tolerability. And in a subset of youth, they may even be at risk for experiencing an antidepressant-induced hypomania. Wow. And you touched on this a little bit, but because of some of these risks associated with these medications, what is the FDA's recommendation for monitoring pediatric patients on an antidepressant? So there are several recommendations, and there is a monitoring schedule for youth who are put on an antidepressant. 
For the first four weeks of starting an antidepressant, it is recommended that there be close follow-up, in fact, as frequently as weekly, to ensure that a child is experiencing a positive response to the medication and isn't experiencing any unreasonable side effects. Then after four weeks, you can switch to bi-weekly follow-up for about a month. And after 12 weeks, as clinically indicated, and less than 10% of patients are actually monitored as recommended during the first four weeks. Usually kids get a prescription and they're sent away. And less than 20% of patients are monitored as recommended during the second month of treatment. About a third of patients are monitored as recommended after 12 weeks. So your question about monitoring is an important one and merits some further exploration for why in clinical settings we're not able to achieve this recommended schedule. In part, it's also related to a number of factors, but we should try at the very least to follow FDA monitoring recommendations. What is the prevalence of bipolar disorder in the pediatric population and how does this change depending on age? Is this higher in the adolescent population? So it's interesting that bipolar disorder in contrast to depression is less common. And the younger the age of onset, the more common in youth with a family history of bipolar disorder. So in other words, if you experience symptoms associated with bipolar disorder at a younger age, it's very likely that you have someone else in your family who's also been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The lifetime prevalence of bipolar disorder in youth tends to be between 0.06 to 0.1 percent. And if you expand the prevalence to spectrum disorders, then it can go anywhere upwards of 5 to 6 percent. Overall, more recently, epidemiological studies suggest that about 3 percent on average of kids meet criteria for bipolar 1 or 2 disorder. And this is very similar to the lifetime prevalence rates in adults 18 to 65, where bipolar 1 disorder is anywhere between 1 to 2 percent and more spectrum disorders, inclusive of bipolar 2 disorder, are upwards of 3.9 to 4.6 percent. The bottom line is that the rates in adolescents and adults are fairly similar. And in children, it tends to be, particularly prior to adolescence, much more rare. That's so interesting. Could you speak to us about the bipolar spectrum and the diagnosis of hypomania in children? Yeah, so the continuum of mania across a spectrum is a very interesting phenomenon. We have a tendency uh, as humans to simplify things into nice, neat categories. And unfortunately, the human experience is not quite so simple. And although categorical classifications may be useful for clinical practice, the reality is that most kids have or fall on a spectrum of mood symptoms or on a continuum that is oftentimes considered more dimensional. I call these kids diagnostic orphans sometimes because it's never really clear that they meet criteria for a DSM-5 diagnosis, but they have all sorts of sub-threshold symptoms that fall into multiple categories of diagnoses. And it's often true, too, that treatment can muddy the diagnostic waters and make it hard to determine whether or not a family history or response to an antidepressant is driving any particular symptom presentation. Kids with unipolar depression and a little bit of mania are more likely to have an eventual diagnostic conversion to bipolar disorder than kids who have not experienced any manic symptoms. So that little bit of mania can potentially have an important predictive role, just as family history of a bipolar disorder can. And it's actually the case that over a third of kids with unipolar depression often are re-diagnosed with bipolar disorder in the future, and almost two-thirds of patients with bipolar 2 disorder are initially diagnosed as having simply unipolar depression. So the boundaries about who fits into a unipolar versus a bipolar category, or even the presence of subthreshold hypomania symptoms, 
ends up being very important in terms of understanding the prognostic future of a diagnosis on the horizon. And we also understand that depression is a heterogeneous condition. It's been hypothesized to occur along a spectrum ranging from unipolar to bipolar depression, and several clinical and patient history characteristics can range on this spectrum as well. So features like aggression and impulsivity can be very prevalent in certain categories of diagnoses like bipolar 1 disorder and less prevalent in kids or adults with unipolar depression. Other characteristics like older age at onset of your first depressive episode are more evident in patients with unipolar depression and less prevalent in kids or adults with bipolar 1 disorder. Hostility, for example, is very prevalent in individuals with bipolar 2 disorder compared to patients with unipolar depression, but it's less prominent in bipolar 1 compared to bipolar 2. So together, all of these data suggest that it's super important to get an accurate family history to do a thorough and comprehensive assessment of psychiatric and other medical conditions. And clinicians may be better able to distinguish among disorders that lie along a bipolar spectrum when they are followed along a continuum or longitudinally over time. I think you learn more about a patient's evolving symptoms when you follow or track the symptoms over time. And with that, what are some important tips for diagnosing children with mixed depression? It sounds like following them longitudinally might be very important when it comes to this. Absolutely. The dynamics of mood symptoms is critically important, not just because the conditions are episodic and wax and wane and change with time, comorbidity or co occurring conditions like attention deficit with hyperactivity. Are, and anxiety disorders are the rule rather than the exception. So teasing apart the relations among these symptoms in a given individual can be super helpful to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. And it's absolutely critical that every patient, every single time, is asked if he or she is experiencing any manic or hypomanic symptoms. And if there's a family history of bipolar disorder, these two questions are critical for better understanding whether someone meets criteria for ADHD or bipolar disorder. Those predictive factors can help us understand not just for diagnostic accuracy, but prevent kids from getting exposed to treatments that potentially could worsen symptoms. So a kid with mixed depression whether it's unipolar depression with some mixed features or subthreshold or syndromal levels of bipolar disorder, all require a very careful assessment of the symptoms and their relationship to other symptoms and their course over time. And there's some very helpful tools that can help facilitate this assessment. You can use a bipolar depression rating scale a mini international neuropsychiatric interview or other structured interviews that can get at the episodes, the relationships of symptoms, between symptoms, that you can also assess specifically mixed features using the clinically useful depression outcome scale with DSM-5 mixed or the KUDOS-M, which is a self-report assessment of current hypomanic symptoms. And there's even a checklist, the hypomania checklist, which can allow patients to provide some information about lifetime hypomanic or manic symptoms. The bottom line is any assessment of depression merits an evaluation of manic and hypomanic symptoms. Without that information, no one can make a determination accurately of whether or not this is truly a unipolar depression or a bipolar depression. That was excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all of that important information with us. What are some of the consequences then of misdiagnosis or of inappropriate treatment for a child who should have been diagnosed with mixed depression? So this is where the rubber hits the road, frankly. We need to be much, much more systematic about our evaluation of youth because if we get the diagnosis wrong, the treatment might not be appropriate. And what can happen as a result of misdiagnosis or inappropriate treatment 
is years, sometimes even up to a decade or more of unnecessary suffering and morbidity, possibly the development of what people would coin as treatment resistance. My kid's not responding to anything is what we hear parents say. They've been through five different agents of medications and the trial and error experiments all seem to fail. Um, After a while, the likelihood of responding to an eventually appropriate treatment diminishes after many treatment failures. You can imagine the morale one might experience after several failures in a row and you lose hope after a while. The other aspect that's of particular concern is that you might experience, if you're given the wrong medication or wrong treatment, a treatment emergent activation syndrome, where the treatment itself, well intended to try to address depressive symptoms, actually results in the opposite effect. Instead of being helpful, ends up creating undue harm through a series of symptoms that look like Mania. So someone who is presumed to have unipolar depression, if the hypomania or mania symptoms are missed and is treated with uh, an antidepressant, could well develop the opposite pole effects, which could have their own negative consequences, including the development of treatment emergent mania. Ultimately, what's most concerning is uh, an increased risk for suicidality. We already know that individuals with mixed depression are at relatively increased risk for suicidality compared to individuals who don't have mixed features. In fact, non-euphoric hypomanic symptoms like psychomotor agitation, impulsivity, irritability, and racing or crowded thoughts combined with depressive symptoms are a recipe for increased risk for suicide. In fact, people will say that the presence of mixed features increases the risk of suicidality by four times in both unipolar and bipolar depression. So 70% of depressed suicide attempters are actually in a mixed episode when they attempt. And almost 80% of youth with bipolar disorder with mixed features actually report a lifetime suicidality and suicide attempts. So the preponderance of this risk is inordinately high for youth with mixed features. And we actually believe that mixed depression may underlie the connection between antidepressant use and suicidality. So in pediatric populations in which mixed episodes are often the rule rather than the exception, This becomes even more important for us to better understand because both young age at onset of depression and mixed features are strong indicators of bipolarity. And that culmination of risk factors potentially can predispose youth with suicide risk compared to the general population. Wow, those statistics are are somewhat shocking. So thank you for sharing that with us. And Based on what you said, then what treatments are available and appropriate for children with mixed depression? There are a number of first-line monotherapeutic treatments available that are even FDA-approved for the treatment of mania and mixed bipolar disorder. Unipolar depression with mixed features do not have FDA indications at this time. But for youth down to age 10, there are a number of atypical antipsychotics and lithium that are approved for the treatment of acute manic and mixed states. For youth with bipolar 1 depression, olanzapine fluoxetine combination and lorazidone have also recently undergone FDA approval. And more maintenance treatments are needed to better understand the long-term trajectories. There is absolutely an unmet need here in terms of understanding what evidence supports the use of these kinds of agents for the treatment of mixed states in the context of bipolar depression and in the context of longer term maintenance. However, the FDA approved atypical antipsychotics and lithium are a great place for people to begin. The overall approach for treating monotherapeutically, treating mixed states for individuals with bipolar disorder across the lifespan 
involve a combination of either mood stabilizers, atypical antipsychotics, or antidepressants in those rare patients who essentially have no symptoms of hypomania because antidepressant monotherapy in and of itself is not recommended for anyone who might have any hypomanic or manic symptoms. For people who have some hypomania or mania symptoms, it's either atypical antipsychotics or mood stabilizers, initially monotherapeutically or with rational combinations, if necessary, is what the current treatment guidelines suggest. Excellent. What treatments have demonstrated scientific efficacy for bipolar disorder in pediatrics? So there are a number of studies that have been done to demonstrate the acute benefit of atypical antipsychotics and mood stabilizers for the treatment of acute manic or mixed states and some recent approvals for atypical antipsychotics for bipolar 1 depression. We have aripiprazole that has been approved for youth with bipolar disorder for acute mania and mixed states and is also approved for bipolar maintenance and approved for unipolar depression. Acenapine shows some efficacy in mixed depression and is approved for bipolar mania. Brexpiprazole is FDA approved for depression. Cariprazine is approved for bipolar depression as well as bipolar mania in adults and is still awaiting trials in kids. There is some evidence of efficacy for mixed depressed states as well for cariprazine. Lorazidone is approved in adults and youth for bipolar depression. And we recently did a post hoc analysis that suggests some efficacy of lorazidone for mixed or subsyndromal hypomania symptoms in youth. Olanzapine is FDA approved for bipolar depression when it's combined with fluoxetine and it is, of course, monotherapeutically approved for bipolar mania in kids and also shows in adults some evidence of efficacy in mixed depression. Quetiapine is FDA approved for bipolar mania, but the evidence for its efficacy in children has been so far negative, and so it has not been approved for bipolar depression in kids. Risperidone and Ziprazidone are FDA approved for bipolar mania in adults, and Risperidone is also approved for bipolar mania in kids. So there are a number of options for youth who experience acute mania that fall in the class of atypical antipsychotics that have been tested and have demonstrated clear separation from placebo. In terms of mood stabilizers for mixed depression, there are a number of agents that have been tried and tested in youth but predominantly in open-label designs. The only randomized controlled trials that have been conducted in a blinded fashion include lithium and valproate for youth, and lithium shows great efficacy and safety profiles in kids for bipolar mania and has approval for bipolar mania in kids down to age 12. Valproate has had an interesting path in terms of the evidence base. It's been complicated. A number of randomized controlled trials have shown mixed results, and so it has not been FDA approved for treatment and has some limitations due to its side effect profile, particularly for adolescent girls. So the landscape for treatment with atypical antipsychotics and mood stabilizers offers a few options, many of which are FDA approved. If you add to ask about the third prong, antidepressant monotherapy for mixed depression in kids, it's really not recommended to present youth with monotherapy with an antidepressant if there's any evidence, any hint of hypomania or a family history of bipolar disorder. And you will most likely not know if your depressed patient has ever had a hypomanic or manic episode and a family history of bipolarity unless you ask. So every single patient, every single time needs to be approached about these questions before you make 
decisions about treatment. And any patient on an antidepressant monotherapeutically should regularly be monitored for response and assessed for the emergence of hypomania and mania symptoms because this is part of the potential assessment of tolerability. We are currently conducting a randomized controlled trial to determine whether it is safe for youth at risk for bipolar disorder based on a family history to be treated with a monotherapy antidepressant treatment. And those youth are being randomized to either an antidepressant or placebo and monitored for treatment emergent mania and hypomania symptoms. So we hope to have more data to support recommendations, thoughtful recommendations about when to offer youth antidepressant monotherapy and when to consider alternative and more conservative approaches. In a recent meta-analysis of about 34 randomized clinical trials, testing 14 different antidepressants in youth, ages ranging anywhere between 9 to 18 years, found that only fluoxetine was superior to placebo in reducing symptoms of depression. So we know that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors may be more effective for treating pediatric anxiety In fact, Mm -hmm. even more so than pediatric depression, in Mm -hmm. part because of the strong placebo effect that has been observed in pediatric unipolar depression clinical trials. But in the grand scheme of things, if you haven't done an assessment of hypomania or mania symptoms, you will not be able to accurately determine whether or not your pediatric patient is at risk for developing a treatment emergent side effect due to antidepressant exposure. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And especially thank you for sharing those research findings and the ongoing research. I think that's so exciting that you're involved in that research. And I think we all look forward to hearing about the findings on that. May I just add one more comment? I think the pediatric literature is often looking to see what the adult literature might suggest or provide clues for on how to handle issues around tolerability for kids. People are generally very conservative about treating children with the same agents or the same doses, and kids are not little adults. We've known that for quite some time now. So we treat children very differently with the appreciation that their physiology and their responses to treatment are going to be unique to their own systems. But when you're prescribing antidepressants to patients with bipolar depression among adults, there's some controversy about monotherapy with antidepressants, even in the adults. And you only have to look at the STEP-BD or Systematic Treatment Enhancement Program for Bipolar Disorder Studies to give the clues as to why we are so conservative about providing antidepressant monotherapy in individuals with bipolar depression. This STEP-BD study was the largest federally funded study of bipolar disorder treatment, and it included some important randomized clinical trial data involving subsamples of thousands of patients. Over 4,000 patients were enrolled in this study. And they came up with three very important findings that help guide why our recommendations around antidepressant treatment, particularly in the presence of any hypomania or mania symptoms, exist. First of all, antidepressants are not more effective than placebo for bipolar depression. The antidepressants, when added to a mood stabilizer, didn't induce mood switches to mania, but patients who participated were probably at very low risk for switching. So patients with bipolar depression with mixed features that may be defined as having two or more manic symptoms with their depression, like agitation and racing thoughts, develop manias over the next several months that were more severe compared to patients who were randomized to placebo, which suggests that the mixed feature phenotype is very sensitive to antidepressant therapy. And in a group of 86 bipolar patients who had been put on an antidepressant when depressed and seemed to respond also were identified in this sample of the STEP-BD study. Some were rapid cyclers, but all were also on mood stabilizers like the lithium, valproate, or second-generation antipsychotics. And 
When these patients were randomized to stay on their antidepressants or discontinue them, the rapid cycling patients who were continued on their antidepressant had triple the number of depressions per year compared to non-rapid cyclers. And in patients whose antidepressant was discontinued, there was no difference in the rate of depressions between rapid and non-rapid cycling individuals. So depressive morbidity and cycling were worsened by continuing an antidepressant in people who experienced rapid cycling. Another very important observation and underscores why it's so important to evaluate for hypomania and mania symptoms in in individuals with depression. And the third clue that we have is from the longitudinal assessment of these patients who enrolled in the STEP-BD study, where they found that In the first 1,500 patients who were followed in this study, who were evaluated for antidepressant-associated irritability or irritable dysphoria, they found that this particular irritable dysphoria was caused by treating patients who had bipolar depression with an antidepressant. This patient sample included about 63% of patients with bipolar 1 disorder with depression, with most of the rest being bipolar 2. And the researchers identified a subsample of 83 patients in whom a depressive episode developed during the study period and for whom there was at least one year of follow-up information. And what they found when they prospectively followed these individuals is that those who received an antidepressant for their depression had a tenfold higher risk for antidepressant-associated chronic irritable dysphoria than the patients who were antidepressant-free. So these clues over time and following adults with these conditions over time give me pause as a clinician when I see patients presenting who are developmentally more vulnerable to side effects and make me wonder whether I should just be you know, itching to put that prescription of an antidepressant down automatically and perhaps not even monitoring kids at the recommended pace because both of those monitoring of hypomania symptoms and following kids over time are essential for a safe and positive experience with antidepressant therapy. So I think these findings from the Step BD studies indicate that antidepressants really should be avoided in most cases in treating acute depression in patients who have bipolar disorder. Why it's not unreasonable to imagine that you can choose among five medications that have a reasonable evidence base for effectiveness and safety in treating uh, and preventing bipolar depressions. You've got your options like lithium, quetiapine, lamotrigine, lorazidone, and cariprazine or combinations of these that have a very strong evidence base to support them. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. And and you touched on this a little bit, but my last question would be, what are some of the side effects that are associated with these pharmacological treatments in the pediatric population? And what could be done about these? I think the atypical antipsychotics are the most commonly used and have the most FDA approval and evidence base to support them. And tolerability of atypical antipsychotics ends up being a major challenge, particularly in pediatric populations. Specifically, the most common side effects are sedation, weight gain, and on rare occasions, extrapyramidal symptoms for a subset of atypical antipsychotics. And so each agent may have a different risk-benefit profile based on each of these issues and depending on patient preference on which ones should be used, but they all should be effectively monitored for any of these side effects and regularly monitored, including an assessment of body mass index and weight regularly. And the American Diabetic Association also has some recommendations for assessment beyond weight of fasting glucose and lipid profiles and insulin to assess for the emergence of insulin resistance in youth who are treated with atypical antipsychotics. 
Sedation and weight gain are also challenges for some mood stabilizers, such as valproate, but polycystic ovarian syndrome is something that's uniquely a challenge for females who utilize valproate and other challenges with lithium specifically. Though lithium is relatively weight sparing, it also has a narrow therapeutic index and youth have to be encouraged to drink lots of water, particularly in dry and heated climates. So lithium, though generally well tolerated, can also result in thyroid dysfunction and kidney dysfunction. So has to be monitored beyond just therapeutic levels on those factors. So kids who are exposed to atypical antipsychotics and mood stabilizers for the treatment of bipolar disorder ought to be carefully monitored and followed regularly for tolerability. And I always like to have the very real conversations with patients and their parents about how the medication is helping to prevent uh, mood recurrence and what are the potential factors that contribute to tolerability challenges. Because for kids, the major consideration is acceptance of treatment. If you'd believe it, Sabrina, only about a third of adolescents with bipolar disorder are taking their medications a year out from when they're initially prescribed. So that says a lot about why we need to really continue to have an ongoing conversation with youth and their parents about compliance or treatment adherence, because usually when they're not taking their medications is when we see the relapse and complications from treatment arise. But a major challenge for youth is a a combination of sedation and weight gain. Those two common side effects make it very challenging for kids to engage with treatment. And so balancing the discussions about efficacy and mood stabilization with continued conversations about how we can minimize risk and get kids to the minimal needed dose to maintain stability can be very productive for a positive prognostic outcome and a positive therapeutic relationship. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh, and thank you for being on our show and sharing such excellent information with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This NEI podcast episode is brought to you by NEI Max. Given the unique circumstances of this year, our spring and fall meetings have been combined into one super psychopharmacology meeting. Join us for an experience like no other and get ready to be educated, invigorated, and empowered to improve the lives of your patients. Learn more at nei.global forward slash nei max. Thank you.